Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen, I am the Curious Owlbear, and I'm here to explore everything Dungeons and Dragons. Loot, treasure, magical items. The things every adventurer seeks, if only to better pursue their main interests. I could talk for hours about the different magical items in Dungeons and Dragons, and to be honest, this is my second attempt at recording this video, as I rambled for about 30 minutes the first time. Today, I want to cover my general best practices for handing out magical items, a couple of the named artifacts from the DMG, and a few homebrewed examples of named artifacts. There will be timestamps in the comment section below if you'd like to skip ahead to a particular section. Before we get started, don't forget to crit those like and subscribe buttons if you'd like to see more D&D videos in the future. Attaining a magical item could be a journey to collect gold, an improbable find inside of a treasure vault, or the culmination of a quest. But however one gets the magical item, it is always an exciting event. If you are a new DM, my number one suggestion for using magical items is to ensure that they fit into the world you've created. For example, if your players are going up against a high level wizard, what type of wands would this wizard have in their possession? Conversely, would this wizard really have a Vorpal Greatsword? Your players may turn into ravenous hyenas as they rummage through the corpses of their enemies, but this will add a little bit of intrigue and uniqueness to your world. Perhaps the enemy has a magical cape that reflects the colors of the night sky, a massive headdress that glows with arcane energy, or perhaps it's a walking cane that seems to have some arcane sigils strewn about. This tactic works well for friendly NPCs too. The players may begin to hear stories about different NPCs and the various named artifacts that they carry, which could lead to a myriad of side quests. Number two, I recommend handing out physical item cards for each of the items that you hand out. Whether you're using these beautiful official magic cards or some homemade index cards like this, your players will be excited to hold the item in their hands as they read the text aloud to the rest of the party. This technique has the secondary benefit of notifying your players when they have successfully identified a magical item. You can describe the items they find in great detail, while withholding information about the magical effects, until the players successfully identify it, at which point you hand them the card. If you're an amazing artist, this is your moment to shine. If you're making homebrewed index cards, then you can change and adapt the items to better fit your world, and you can illustrate them on the other side. This is a good transition into my final best practice. I recommend adjusting the magical items in the DMG to better suit your players and your world. This could be as simple as describing a sending stone that is embedded into a necklace, or it could be as complicated as a sentient sort of answering that cheers on your fighter. Whatever the case, this will have veteran and new players alike guessing as to the magical benefits of each item in your world. It adds complexity to the items, as your players may prefer one plus one short sword over another, just for the aesthetics. Finally, I think this is really important, as it ties into the main subject of this video. If you create a magical item that's a little bit adjusted from what's in the DMG, that could be the basis of this item's name. Now let's take a look at some of the named artifacts that are included in the Dungeon Master Guide. You may be familiar with the Sword of Kos, as it is one of the most well-known examples of a sentient magical item. It also had some great usage during Critical Role's first campaign. What does it want from you in return? Anything? Oh, that's a good question, but, uh, what, <laughs> what do you require from me in return? <laughs> Just wield me. Spill blood for me. Bring me to the Undying King and cut his throat with my blade. That's all I ask. That's all I need. It really doesn't ask much. <laughs> I think this is a great item due to its balance of negative and positive magical effects. Of course, it's a plus three longsword with a multitude of various magical properties, but it also crits on a 19 or 20 and deals extra damage to undead. At the same time, however, the sword must be bathed in blood one minute after being drawn from its sheath, or the wielder will need to make a charisma saving throw lest they be dominated by the sword. 
This combination of strong beneficial magic and potent detrimental magic can provide your players with a lot of role-playing opportunities. In addition, this sword's connection to the evil god Vecna is also well known. Koss was once one of Vecna's top lieutenants, until Koss was convinced by this sword that he should overthrow his master. Although Koss was apparently successful, so too was his master in destroying his former top lieutenant. Now all that remains of the great lieutenant Koss is this sword. This is the perfect example of a storyline that could be continued through your campaign. It may even be the exact tool your party needs in order to defeat a god. Another amazing well-known artifact is the Wand of Orcus. Many adventurers have heard of the Lord of the Nine Hells and his, of his great brutality, and many of these adventurers also know of the great wand that this Dark Lord wields. The wand has a variety of magical properties, many stemming from its power over the undead, but it also acts as a mace that deals extra necrotic damage on every hit. It holds a variety of magical spells which can be cast using charges. However, those who are attuned to the wand can cast the spells using less charges than those who are not attuned to it. I think this is a great mechanic that can define how and when the wand is used. And I think it should be added to other magical items. For example, you could create a high level wand of fireballs that could cast fireball at 5th level with a single charge instead of 3. The Wand of Orcus is another sentient named artifact. While it is possible for one to steal the wand away from the Lord of the Nine Hells, it has a variety of means to get back to its master. But my favorite aspect of the wand is the steps that the players need to go through to destroy it. The skull that sits atop the wand belongs to an ancient adventurer who was slain by Orcus. In order to destroy the wand, it must be taken to the prime material plane, where it can be bathed in positive energy. This energy is said to have the power to unmake the wand. However, if the adventurer whose skull sits atop the wand is not present during the ritual, the wand simply rematerializes next to Orcus. Artifact items need to be very difficult to destroy, otherwise they would have been destroyed long before they would have been able to make a name for themselves. However, having a method to destroy a magical item could provide your players with a long-term goal that could be the main storyline of several sessions. Both of the named artifacts we have covered are good examples of this, and of the sentience that a magical item could provide. In a campaign that my group recently completed, I had the pleasure of playing a wizard alongside three other PCs, including my wife who played a Goliath Barbarian. Around level 9, our group was able to recover an ancient named artifact called Sky Shatter from a Goliath burial chamber. It was the first of four named artifacts that we would eventually recover, and each became a long storyline that our group had to agree to pursue. I was able to recover the signet ring of an ancient wizard sometime later, I think it was around levels 12 to 14. Now, in this high magic setting, we steadily gathered more magical items to improve our arsenal as we leveled. So by the time I got my ring around level 12, Sky Shatter had become a little less potent. It was around this time that our DM came up with a great idea to improve the items as we leveled. As we achieved goals specific to our backstory or class, the item would evolve or unlock new abilities. It was like taking inspiration one step further by giving us a permanent improvement. This enabled our DM to keep the named artifacts balanced with the best magical items we had gathered, without giving our low-level party a Vorpal Greatsword or something of that nature. We all became very attached to our items, and they even became parts of our characters' personas. Wherever we went in the world, we were recognized either for our great deeds or for our named artifacts by everyone we came across. In closing, Dungeons & Dragons has a wide variety of magical items and named artifacts. I highly recommend exploring the DMG to see what's available. However, I also recommend adjusting the items you find there to better suit your players and your world. In the comment section below, make sure to let me know which magical item is your favorite, whether it's artifact level or not, and I'll be sure to give you a response. Don't forget to smash those like and subscribe buttons with your luck blades on the way out. Until next time, stay curious adventurers.